Well, welcome back to the uh, Delta Independent Science Board meeting. Um, I think most of you are aware that the Delta Independent Science Board is, is uh, currently reviewing the entire monitoring enterprise for the Delta, both the biological, natural, and, and uh, social science aspects of it. And what we've done is teamed up with the um, science program to put together uh, right now a series of three invited speakers followed by panels to really inform us on a wide variety of topics related to monitoring that will help us in our review process. And so today is the first, uh, first one of those three, the other, the, the other two will be in uh, January. Um, Today, um, so what we're going to have is a, is a guest uh, seminar speaker, and that will be followed by a panel. For those of you who want to look at the material up front, the, the short bios of each of the panel members is up there, and we'll have them introduce themselves once we start the uh, panel after the seminar. Our uh, guest seminar speaker today is uh, Dr. Stacy Sherman. We appreciate her, her uh, uh, coming here today. And uh, she's received her uh, bachelor's degree in zoology from Louisiana State University and a PhD in marine biology and fisheries at the University of Miami Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. She's the environmental program manager of the fish restoration program monitoring team at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, is responsible for assessing the biological effectiveness of 8,000 acres of tidal wetland restoration in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. She's also the chair of the IEP's Tidal Wetland Monitoring <coughs> Program work team. And uh, today she's going to be talking to us specifically about the, um, the brief overview of the fish restoration program and description of current efforts to develop standard methods for monitoring the effectiveness of tidal wetland restoration. Thank you. <coughs> uh, I forgot. Afterwards, uh, we invite anyone to come and ask questions. And if you have a question, we have a microphone set up. And uh, so please come up and use that and, and ask questions. We'll have the uh, public first, and then the board will have a chance when uh, Stacy joins the panel. All right. Thanks very much for the invitation. I have to apologize in advance. I have a cold, of course. So um, if I get a little croaky or have to sip some tea. If I get completely incoherent, we'll just blame the day quill. All right. Okay, so I want to get started with some acknowledgments. I'd like to uh, thank my funders, the State Water Project through DWR. Um, we have a lot of great collaborators in this community, the Interagency Ecological Program Science Management Team and the IEP Tidal Wetland Monitoring Project Work Team, which um, my team facilitates. It's given us a lot of guidance. And then there's also a lot of uh, people who are working on the fish restoration program, um, three units that I'll, I'll talk about later. But I especially want to acknowledge my uh, current permanent staff who are pictured here on the bottom. So we have Rosemary Hartman, who's also on the panel. She's a senior environmental scientist. Uh, Dave Contreras is an environmental scientist. Those two get extra thanks because they made a lot of maps and figures for me. Uh, we have another environmental scientist, Dan Ellis. We have one permanent lab position, uh, Ryan Koch, who's uh, pictured here. And then at any one time, we can have two uh, temporary positions. And then Matt Siepert with the fish drives us around and keeps everything working. So it's a pretty small crew, and I want you to remember that uh, when we're talking about the, the work that we do. So um, basically, I'm going to uh, run through the why, what, and how of the monitoring specific to our program. Um, we have a handy little progress bar down at the bottom. So if you doze off and then wake up, you know where we are and how much more you need to sit through. <clears throat> so most of you probably know this, but our program is focused on the upper San Francisco estuary. And so that includes the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta and the Sassoon Marsh, which is outlined in red here. Um, I likely will be saying Delta, um, but also meaning Sassoon Marsh throughout the talk. So we all know it's a very important area. It takes, yeah, you have water from all of the green wet parts of the state going through it to get to the not so wet parts of the state that are in, in tan here. 
So if you had been in the Delta prior to the gold rush, you would have seen seas of toolies, lots of little reticulated uh, tidal channels, lots of wildlife, maybe a grizzly bear. Um, but things changed after the gold rush. So we had this great extent of wetlands in the green, so on the left side of the screen here, um, prior to the gold rush. And then afterwards, there is this several decades of land reclamation. And so what's left now is just a tiny, tiny fraction of what was there historically. And so what looked like this in the Delta uh, now looks like this. So most of the reclamation was for uh, agriculture or um, we had conversion to managed uh, diked wetlands that were non-tidal. So the Fish Restoration Program exists to turn some of that back the other way. So to restore tidal influence to at least 8,000 acres of wetlands in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. And there are three units within the, the Fish Restoration Program. So DWR is actually doing the work and paying for it. Um, and that's Dennis McEwen's crew. Dennis is in the audience there. Um, and then there's a separate CDFW unit in my office in Stockton, uh, run by Jim Starr, and they do help with the implementation and the planning and design. And then my crew, uh, we're the monitoring team. And so we're somewhat of a, a separate entity, but we, we work all together. Now, related but separate is the Interagency Ecological Program Tidal Wetland Monitoring Project Work Team. Um, so this is a, a group, it's open to anyone who'd like to come, and we have 120 people on the email list and a good 30 uh, regular active participants. And uh, we're all wetland nerds who like to get together and, and talk about, you know, oh, what's, what's going to happen when we do this restoration, and what do we need to monitor, and, and you know, how do we do that best? Um, and then there's my team that's actually doing monitoring, and so we have a, a measure of reality, and we, we kind of communicate between the two. Um, so I'll be talking about both of these uh, through the talk. Okay, so why would DWR restore 8,000 acres of tidal wetlands? The short answer is the Fed said so. Um, so it's part of, this is a requirement of uh, the reasonable and prudent alternatives that go with the, the permits to operate the state water project and the Central Valley project. So there's a, a whole bunch of things that go into this reasonable and prudent alternative. Uh, but one of the, the things for several of the, the permits is habitat restoration. So um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service in 2008 issued a biological opinion for delta smelt. And that's, that's where that specific number comes from, 8,000 acres. And it's tidal wetlands and associated subtidal uh, area. And that's in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. The National Marine Fisheries Service has a separate biological opinion. And for salmonids, they include a requirement to restore rearing habitat, which a lot of that is floodplain, but the uh, 8,000 acres also counts as, as rearing habitat. And then my department has jurisdiction over long fence melt. They're not federally listed, but they are state listed. And so for the incidental take permit there, uh, 800 acres of restoration needs to be in a in mesohaline habitat. So <clears throat> it's not just an arbitrary requirement. There's some good uh, reasons behind wanting to restore wetlands. So especially for salmonids, we know that they, they're fat and happy when they're, they have access to vegetated habitat. So Carson Jeffries work, Ted Summers, others here in the, the Yola Bypass, like Simnus River uh, floodplains, we know that they grow really well. We know from elsewhere in the Columbia River Basin, I just saw a great report out of the uh, Nisqually River estuary, that salmon do really well when you have uh, restored wetlands for them to access. And you can even increase the diversity of life histories that they can exhibit, and which will increase the resilience of the, the species. Now, delta smelt and long fin smelt, though, are pelagic. So is this going to provide habitat? 
there's evidence that it might. Um, so Liberty Island in the North Delta, right here, uh, was farmed. And in 1997, I think uh, the, the levees breached and it flooded and they just never repaired it. So it's been you know, restoring ever since. And we find Delta smelt there, like not infrequently. Um, Lenny Grimaldo et al. also published a report this just this year about finding itsy bitsy tiny long fin smelt way up in tidal channels and in wetlands, uh, indicating that if they're if not spawning, they're at least rearing in there. So they could be using uh, wetlands as habitat as well. And habitat, um, in whatever form it, it takes, is an important uh, piece of why pelagic organisms kind of all, all of a sudden, um, well, not all of a sudden, but took an extra precipitous decline um, in the early 2000s. And so this is the conceptual model behind the uh, pelagic organism decline. And habitat's part of it, um, but another part that is related to restoration is the food web part, the bottom up. So we know from everywhere that wetlands exist that they're really productive and uh, they act as nursery habitat in a lot of places. And so you have wetlands and it's a pretty good bet that you're gonna have fish food as well. <clears throat> we also have this idea of outwelling. So uh, formal evaluations of the outwelling hypothesis have mostly taken place in salt marshes, but there's evidence that you have uh, areas that are next to really productive wetlands that benefit from subsidies uh, from, from the wetlands. And um, you know, staple isotope work that like Michael Weinstein and others has, has done has shown that fish that don't even go into the wetlands can benefit from wetland-derived productivity. Okay, so the fish restoration program, the objectives are to restore the 8,000 acres as directed, um, to enhance food production and availability for native delta fishes, restore the processes that might help some of that productivity get out into the pelagic food web, increase the amount and quality of salmonid rearing habitat, and by so doing, hopefully increase the, what is currently abysmally low uh, through delta survival of juvenile salmonids. Okay, so we know why we're restoring, uh, why are we monitoring? Short answer is we're, we have to. <laughs> um, but this is, there's of course compliance monitoring. So if you're doing any sort of uh, project where you're moving ground or doing anything, you, you need to make sure that you're following all of the, uh, the rules and, and doing what you said you would do. Um, but that's not really the focus of my team. We are really focused on effectiveness monitoring. So w are these projects meeting their objectives? Is the program as a whole meeting its biological objectives? <clears throat> and there's a lot of uncertainties that we need to address that you can only do if you actually have good data. So um, one uncertainty is we don't really know um, what the, the historic marshes were like. I mean, we have some ideas from SFEI's historical ecology work, but it's not like the pioneers were out there taking pre-project data before they did some um, reclamation. Um, and then we have so little marsh left, um, it's, it's difficult to know, you know, what, what's, what's the natural variability here? You know, how do they work in different parts of the delta? And we have had some focus studies. There's a series of uh, the breach experiments and studies that have looked at some of our remnant wetlands, looked especially at, at Liberty Island, but nothing that's really sustained long-term. <clears throat> um, even if we could restore the extent of historic marsh, we would not be back to where we were historically, uh, because we have a novel system now. There's a bunch of other stressors here. So non-native species that are predators, competitors, ecosystem engineers. We also have a profoundly altered hydrograph. We have uh, contaminants, a variety of them, um, and the climate's changing. So things are, will never be the way that they, they were. And even in the most pristine wetland, 
um, there's a lot of variability. These are complex systems. Um, so in, when Richard Dame looked at the outwelling hypothesis in North, North Inlet, he found that there was a really uh, seasonal signal to it, and there's a lot of variability having to do with air pressure and, and all sorts of things. And in the delta here, Peggy Lehman looked at Liberty Island and estimated fluxes of materials on and off the island uh, just for one year. And she found, uh, for example, copepods, which are on this graph, in the spring and the fall, uh, Liberty was a source of copepods to the adja adjacent channels. <clears throat> But in the summer, it was, it was a sink. So things are gonna vary, and it would be naive of us to think that we're gonna build wetlands and they're just gonna pump food into the surrounding habitat. And so we need to have an idea of what, what is their benefit, because uh, there's a lot of tidal action, and so you have, on the scale of a tidal cycle, food being made available. Um, is, that, is that good enough, and, and how does that work in different parts of the, the estuary? And um, of course, you know, especially when you have a lot of uncertainty, you have to monitor to be able to learn and do the next projects better. So um, that's why we are monitoring. Now, um, what are we monitoring? So my team specifically is tasked with monitoring the uh, projects for the fish restoration program. And not all restoration in the estuary is part of the program. So um, there's some confusion on that point. You know, people are like, why aren't you uh, monitoring Dutch Slough or McCormick Williamson track? And it's like, no, that's, that's not our program. Um, so the projects that are in the works are outlined in yellow. We have Prospect, Fly Flyway Farms, Bradmore, uh, Julie Red, Winter Island, Decker Island, and then we thought that was very, very important to also look at what remnant or re other restoring marshes are around and use those as comparisons. So we fully acknowledge that there is no pristine reference wetland within this estuary. Um, but if we're to have any hope of determining whether changes that we see are due to restoration or something else, we need to be monitoring other wetlands as well. And so each one of our sites has a as a comparison wetland that we've chosen, that we monitor. <clears throat> so our focus is on fish food. Um, so it, we have to have a narrow scope. As I mentioned, we have a kind of a small crew. And so there's a lot of other stuff going on that we are not capturing. Um, one of our tenants is to ask for help, um, especially in an estuary that's kind of notorious for combat science. Uh, I want no part of that. And so that's where the, uh, the project work team comes in. We invite people, come tell us your ideas. Um, let's talk about it. Let's you know, argue, whatever. Come up with some plans, and then we'll go and test them and, and kind of bring that back to you. And so the, the major products of the project work team is to develop a set of conceptual models that describe how we think uh, wetland restoration is going to affect the fish that we're, we're worried about, and uh, to use those to develop hypotheses, and then a set of metrics, and then potential methods. And then my team uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting of, of putting all of that together to develop a guidance document that we, are, we released earlier um, this year so that anyone who is doing restoration in the Delta and Sisu Marsh for the purposes <laughs> who have, hopes to have uh, an effect on fish, they can use our same methods and they can use what, what we've been through to help them in developing their plan. And then, of course, we're all about uh, sharing data. So we want other people to share their data as well. So um, we were told to develop a conceptual model, and it turned into nine. Um, they're, all, they're all tied together here, though, in this overview model. Um, and it was released online a couple of weeks ago as uh, IEP technical report number 91. So the URL is right down there. You can go and read it. Um, each model has a chapter that describes the thinking and the literature behind um, our linkages. I'm just going to really quickly run through just, you know, kind of basics of, of what this is about. 
Uh, we stole the tiered structure from the delta smelt mast model. And so the idea is that we're looking at different scales. And so the base of it is a landscape scale, and we have a transport model embedded there. If you zoom in a little bit, we have the local attributes of the around a project site. So this is Prospect Island. And you'd have things like any upland trans transitions and weather and little, you know, whatever is particular to the hydrology there. Um, on the site itself, we have a water quality, which includes its very own uh, contaminants model. That's what Mr. Yuck is there for. Um, <clears throat> hydrology, of course, is important. Uh, the configuration of the the wetland, and we know it's going to change through time, so there's a wetland evolution model embedded here. And then, of course, there's the biotic site attributes. So the food web is super important, um, so we want to know about the productivity that's going on in there. And there's a model for clams, invasive clams in particular, in partic uh, because they can um, affect the production of food or availability of food. And then we have the aquatic vegetation model, um, which more captures the, the action of macrophytes as ecosystem engineers and, and modifiers of the habitat. And then the top tier is what we really care about and our target of fat and happy fish. So we have a delta smelt model, which is just a pared down version of the mast model, and then a salmonid model as well. <clears throat> okay, so the models were tools to help us to identify hypotheses. Um, and I think at one point we were up to close to 200 hypotheses, you know, <laughs> but we had a, a narrow focus on, on fish. And so we did a lot of paring down. I, th I think we got it down to like a 38 or something like that. Uh, but we, we divided them um, into physical uh, food resources and, and stressor type hypotheses. And these are just made available as kind of um, models for particular projects to use as they articulate their own hypotheses. So some are about uh, the topography, the elevation, the evolution of the, the wetland itself. There's a whole suite about vegetation, um, how they'll colonize, what factors will play key roles in their establishment, uh, seasonality, and um, how they act as as ecosystem engineers and, uh, and affect the, the area around them. And then also how fish use the habitat, if the capacity of, um, if it has sufficient capacity su to support them in terms of uh, physical habitat and water quality, whether they actually use it and whether it can be a significant source of refuge. For food resources, uh, we have production on site, um, whether fish actually use it and whether their condition becomes better because of that um, and flux off the site. And then unfortunately, we have a big old stressor list. Um, so harmful algal blooms, particularly cyanohabs, are an issue in the Delta. Uh, clams, also a problem. Non-natives, we already went over that. Birds and mammals, maybe, but why not have a hypothesis about it? And then a suite of negative uh, potential negative impacts of contaminants, and then to be a little more optimistic, uh, the potential for wetland processes to actually um, ameliorate some of the problems that would be associated with contaminants. So those hypotheses are the basis, organizing basis of our tidal wetland monitoring framework for the upper San Francisco estuary, which is now online. Um, and this one is a, is a living document. And so we're hoping that people use it, go make their own plans, do some monitoring, come back and say, hey, this doesn't make sense, or we, this would be, really be helpful, and then email me and then we'll fix it. Um, so we want to have multiple iterations of this and, and we want feedback from people who are actually using our guidance. Um, so the hypotheses, what we're hoping um, with the collection of them is to get to what Simon Static Cordell called the capacity of the site. Um, so can it actually support the fish? Uh, opportunity, can they get there and, and take advantage of the resources? And then realize function. So are we actually seeing increases in uh, condition? Are we seeing 
increases in reproductive capabilities, all of that uh, stuff that's hard to get to. So it's um, unreasonable to think that any one project or program could address 38 hypotheses. Um, so for each project, uh, we recommend that you choose, and this is what we do in our own projects, you choose the hypothe hypotheses that are best related to your objectives and then modify them to match your, your actual site. So um, with all of those, there's a ton of metrics that could be measured or would need to be measured to address all of those hypotheses. Um, any, you know, ranging from very simple, you know, chlorophyll A concentration to uh, accretion rates to histopathology of fish using the site. Um, like the hypotheses, you can't, we can't do it all. And so uh, this is a selection of what my project does on a, on a given site. So this is Decker Island. Um, and this is going to be marsh plain. Uh, this is a little channel. We have some fringing marsh, and then we have the exterior channel. And most of what we're actually um, on the ground monitoring is, is the food web. So looking at phytoplankton uh, composition, as well as chlorophyll light concentration, zooplankton abundance and community composition, uh, water quality, benthic and epibenthic critters as well. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do our monitoring? Um, in general, our, our goal is to, as much as possible, implement a before-after control impact design. So I mentioned that each of our projects has a reference site um, that we just use for comparison. And it's difficult in this estuary to find one that's comparable. Um, so we have Decker Island over here that we we're just looking at. And um, the, the closest suitable one that we could find is over here uh, near Web Tract, and that's our, our reference for that site. Min most of the others are actually much closer, but I just wanted to give you an idea of, of what kinds of uh, constraints we, we need to deal with. Uh, we are, you know, I have five permanent staff right now, so we're very committed to uh, being efficient in our in our monitoring. And so um, we don't want to waste our time either. And we think it's really important to know what the variability is so that we can properly choose sample sizes to actually answer our questions. <clears throat> um, we are also actively seeking out uh, collaborations and coordination. Hopefully, people are doing similar work and are uh, willing to share data so that it's not just us doing all of it. And then, of course, uh, we need to be really transparent. So we document everything. We have um, Rosemary's been working with the IEP a data users work group uh, to make sure that we're meshing with the, what the larger community is doing in terms of metadata. Um, we have pretty rigorous quality control standards in place, and, and we share all of that. <clears throat> OK, so um, for actually you know, collecting samples, uh, when we're looking at how to collect the mesozooplankton and things like mycids, um, macrozooplankton in the water column, um, that was a no-brainer. The IEP has been using these same meshes forever. They're all over the estuary. We want to match, so we're, we're using those methods. Um, other macroinvertebrates, the epibenthic and epiphytic stuff, that's not so, so clear-cut. Um, wetlands have not been really extensively sampled on a long-term basis. And so we went to the wetland uh, monitoring project work team and said, hey, y'all have any ideas? And yes, they did. <laughs> so there, there are a lot of ideas. And hey, this, this works here. And oh, well, so-and-so used this. And, and so we tried it. We, um, we just um, we had our, our first year of pilot work in 2015, and it was gear exploration. So we, we took these ideas, we went out and did the best we could with them. And we found that some things might work well uh, elsewhere. So like throw traps are used pretty often on the Gulf Coast and the East Coast and Spartina. Um, that's fine. It's a little more difficult to use the throw trap here um, in, in Thule. So Spartina is waist high. Um, 
I'm like waist tied to this part uh, to the tulies here. So <laughs> um, throw traps were more truly adjacent in, in that situation. Um, so that one got cut. <clears throat> so the survivors from our, our gear exploration, uh, those gears, we uh, narrowed down the, the number, but then we increased our sample size. And we looked at three regions within the Cashew Compact Complex in the North Delta, uh, Liberty Island, right around Prospect Island, which is a future site, and uh, Lindsay Slough, which is restoring uh, for about two years now, maybe three years now. Um, and what we're doing is looking at what gears can really give us a, a taste of the difference between the sites and also the habitats within the sites. And so we're looking for the best discriminatory value there. Um, so a lot of data came out of that. Um, it's all in our report or summarized in a report also online on the Fish Restoration Program website. And uh, Rosemary submitted a manuscript on Tuesday to Estuaries and Coast, so hopefully they'll It'll also come out there. But um, just to give you a taste of, of the types of data that we have, this is a comparison between uh, leaf packs and sweep nets in the three different regions. And the, don't worry about the names of the colors. They're just different critters. And uh, along each column within each region, we have different habitat types. And so we found both of them did really well uh, distinguishing between sites, but the sweep net was better. Uh, with the habitats within the sites, and it was easier too, so that was a bonus. And then, um, oddly enough, we had, had the same question with fish. So fish are, are fairly well sampled in this estuary, but mostly in the channels and not as much in the wetlands. And so there are a lot of ideas about what we should be doing. And so uh, we tried a bunch of stuff. At the same time, we're trying the macroinvertebrate work. And we worked with UC Davis, um, with Peter Moyle and John Duran's group, uh, as they were doing otter trawling. And we worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service Lodi office as they were doing beach trawling uh, so that we can compare gears and um, hopefully not increase our take of listed species overly much. So that first year, we mostly just eliminated light traps. And then uh, we did a similar work in, in 2016. And so, now, you know, when people ask, well, why are you using uh, beach sains in these sites and, and not lumpar nets, or why are you using the otter trawl instead of a Kodiak? You can say, well, we, we looked at that, and, and this is how it, how it worked out. And those data are also online in that report. Um, we do have a couple of gears in our back pocket because wetlands are very complex, and in some cases, all you can do is throw a cast net. So, all of our, this work uh, we documented as standard operating procedures, and that's the second volume of the Tidal Wetland Monitoring Framework, also online, also a living document. I mean, we do this stuff, and so our instructions make sense to us, but if someone else reads it and says, I have no idea what this means, um, let us know. We'll fix it. <clears throat> so. Um, I mentioned that we want to be efficient and use other data as much as possible, and there's a lot of sampling going on in this estuary. So uh, this table is a selection of that. You can find it in the Tidal Wetland Monitoring Framework, <laughs> along with links to where the actual data uh, lives. Um, and we have a lot of suggestions. We'll use the IEP data. They have sites all over the place. And they do. Um, so this is Sassoon Marsh. There's a lot of sampling going on in there. Uh, the confluence, the North Delta. However, most of that sampling is in places that look like this. It's in the channel. And so our question is, you know, well, we would love to use that data, but does it mean anything for the adjacent, adjacent wetlands? And so um, our current pilot work and next year, so we're in phase three now, phase four is going to continue this, is actually looking to see if that's a valid uh, data set for us to use. And so uh, as IEP goes out, uh, their stations are in the little pink axis here. Uh, we go out at the same time and samples of plankton with them, um, but in the shallows. 
So, um, and we chose the stations that are close to our sites and our reference sites so that we're also getting pre-project data at the same time. <clears throat> so um, it's, it's a lot of samples and um, poor Ryan's probably back in the lab working on this right now. Um, just kidding, Ryan, if you're watching this, it's okay. Um, <laughs> the, um, so we, we, have, um, we have some data from one site just, just to kind of give us a taste. Um, on the left here, we have the copepods from our samples. And on the right are the copepods from the Environmental Monitoring Program, the IEP uh, sample site, which is in the channel nearby. And so we have, uh, we went through the spring and most states we had a higher CPUE in the shallows and we had different community composition. So um, there's a lot of Canthocyclops and Pseudodiaptimus here, whereas the EMP was picking up a lot of your Tamura and the Sinocalus. So it's, it's not the same, which actually is not really surprising. <laughs> I did the same thing uh, with fish. So the fish gears are easily snagged, and um, we want to know, is it where they can fish, is, are they getting the same stuff? And so far, um, with this one site, not so much. Um, so you can't even really see the, the CPUE if you scale it to the same volume of water here. So let's look at the, the uh, percentage community composition. We found also in Decker, and this is in the summer, uh, we have our sampling on the top. We have the summer toe net from IEP on the bottom, and the species are different. So um, in June, we caught a lot of split tail. Um, and kind of throughout the, the summer, uh, toe net was catching a lot of striped bass. We were catching a lot of shad. So it's, it's a different community. We also, of course, want to know what the variability is. I mentioned we want to uh, get an idea of what types of sample sizes we need. We hope that we're oversampling right now, but we don't know. Uh, we'll see. And so we're getting a sense of that also with the zooplankton comparison data. Um, for the macroinvertebrates, though, we're hitting a bunch of different habitats at each site, and it's, it's pretty intensive, and we don't have the manpower to do that samples throughout uh, time. So we have, this past year, we did a, a single spring blitz. And so we went out to all of these areas and took samples in future sites, existing wetlands, uh, managed or natural, and adjacent channels, uh, kind of in a block design. And uh, just kind of did it synoptically across the estuary. And then at Decker Island, we took additional samples throughout the winter and early, uh, yeah, winter and spring to get a better idea of uh, temporal variability, just at that one spot. When we can, we, um, we like to do special studies, but it's, it's a little difficult sometimes to fit them in. Um, but this one we thought was really important in June. Uh, Rosemary did an awesome job wrangling people to do a 24-hour uh, study of whether what we catch during the day in terms of uh, pseudodiaptimus and other copepods is the same thing as what you'd catch at night and whether that's different in the wetlands too. So we all had a great time out on Decker Island and results are, are pending. <laughs> Lots of samples still to sort. Um, we are also trying to find ways to um, be more efficient and, and not uh, increase our take at all. And so we're, we're trying new technologies. We recently, recently received an Eris uh, acoustic camera. And so we're hoping that that's going to be really helpful for us. Uh, Canable out in, at Rutgers threw his on a kayak and was out under the, the piers and actually got pretty good results. And we've used ours. Um, or We've helped in conjunction with the USGS uh, and seen some really interesting behavior that uh, hopefully will be helpful to us. So I mentioned we also like to collaborate. 
we have uh, several ongoing collaborations and hopefully some new ones in the works. Uh, we work with Fred Fires Group at the USGS Aquatic Ecology Group. Um, so with the Eris stuff, we go out and help them shock and they're um, collecting some zooplankton. Hopefully we can also use those data. And they're collecting fish in Rye Island, um, which is helpful to us as well. Um, we have several initiatives with DWR related to vegetation. So they're uh, conducting studies of, as part of the Delta Smelt Resiliency Strategy, ha what happens when you try to reduce vegetation, submerged aquatic vegetation in particular. Um, what does that do for Delta Smelt habitat? And so we're helping with field support there and um, providing data because one of the sites is also our restoration site. So we have all of this macroinvertebrate and zooplankton data there. Uh, and we work with a lot of different UC Davis folks. Um, so I see Alejo out here and we uh, <laughs> try to collect data for human use studies of the Delta. Um, we worked with, I mentioned Peter Moylan, John Duran's group uh, with fish sampling uh, we've collected a lot of water samples and critters for eDNA studies and uh, one stable isotope study with macroinvertebrates. And just last week, we started talking to the USGS uh, Western Ecology Research Center. Uh, they're looking at diving ducks and their use of invertebrates. And so we think we can find some nexus uh, between us and, and the fish food world. So we're hopefully... Hopefully we'll uh, be able to influence some site selections there. All right, um, so my elevator talk of the fish restoration program, effectiveness monitoring. Um, we are really focused on fish food. Um, and I know there's a lot of other stuff that we could be measuring and I would love to, to know about, um, but we have to keep our scope uh, reasonable. Right now we're doing pre-project and long-term program development. So it, it's actually a pretty good time to have review now before we're you know, five years into a long-term plan. And uh, we expect to have 10 years of monitoring post-construction for each of these sites. So we would love, love to be able to characterize the full capacity opportunity and realized function uh, for our sites and for the program as a whole. Um, but we have some constraints that we, we have to consider. A, um, it's hard to work in wetlands. <laughs> so uh, Decker Island, we're like, oh, okay, we'll just get right up to the, the leaky breach there and start taking some samples. And then you arrive and there's a gigantic mat of water primrose blocking your way. And the boat's not going through there. We try to kayak, that's not going through there. Um, so that makes it a little different difficult. Um, and then walking around in, in marshes, also a little bit difficult. Um, time. So I've mentioned I have five permanent staff right now. And our work plan for next year, uh, we'll be taking 758 invertebrate samples um, and 304 fish samples. It's the invertebrate samples that take um, most of the, the work um, for ID, but still, it's a, it's a lot of stuff. And then we're kind of in a catch-22. We're doing restoration to help an imperiled species, but to monitor how it's helping, we might kill some of them. So uh, we do our best to try to, to choose methods uh, that won't, <laughs> won't actually kill Delta smelt. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real balancing act. And kind of related to that, um, we have a, a certain lack of flexibility with our study plans. So our 2018 work was set um, in June of 2017. And so there are times when opportunities arise and it would be great to get out and sample and you, you can't because it's not in your study plan and you don't have take coverage for that. So for example, this past year, we had all of this water and uh, Jim Hobbs is emailing me, there are salmon fry all over the place. You need to get into those wetlands and see if they're in there. And I would love to, and I couldn't. It wasn't in my, my study plan. I didn't have any take coverage, and there was a real risk that we would have caught Delta smelt, and so we just couldn't do it. So I don't know what the, the answer is to that, um, but building some flexibility to take advantage of 
events like that, I think, would be super helpful. <clears throat> All right, so um, there are some questions that you had about uh, to inform your review and what I think gaps are. Um, so one of those is that non-fish restoration pro program projects do not, for the most part, have dedicated funding for monitoring. And I think that's a, a real shame and it's something that needs to be fixed. And then there's all of these other species that use the wetlands, other fish as well, you know, split tail. Um, we would love to be able to give them more love. You know? And what about the mammals? What about the birds? What about the microbes? You know? um, it's too much for us to do, but uh, it's, I think, opportunities that are kind of lost if we can't find ways for, for other people to be collecting data as well. There's a question about meeting management needs, and I'm not sure. So I, I hope we are with the, the fish food. That's, that's a pretty focused question. But I think there are other questions that probably are out there, and maybe you know, managers don't even know that they should be questions. But communication is not always there. So you know, it's great to have a symposium and have you know, scientists come and talk to other scientists, but if you're not actually making that translation to managers and then vice versa, the managers saying this is what's important to us, um, it, it gets difficult to do meaningful work. And then um, what I would love to see from you, you know, what, since I have the chance, um, <laughs> in your review, it'd be great to have, you know, in one place, a list of all the stuff that's going on. And I know you've, you're uh, contracting out to someone, and so hopefully they can you know, do a good job with that. They can start with the Tidal Wetland Monitoring Framework, because we have a big old list in there. <laughs> um, but having um, an accessible list somewhere, and the Delta Science Program seems like a good home for that, uh, would be super helpful. And um, it would be nice to have like a facilitator to work with all of the different groups that are saying that they're coordinating all of the monitoring in the Delta, because there's a whole bunch of those as well. Um, so we need someone to coordinate the coordinators and not necessarily a new coordinating group. Um, and you know, I'm a recovering academic, um, so I would love to do all sorts of special studies and um, we have to be realistic though. So if you, you would just keep in mind, I have five permanent staff <laughs> during your review. I'd appreciate that. Um, so I, I like to end my talks with a drawing from my youngest uh, stepson, Charlie. Uh, when we were working on the conceptual models, Wim Kimmer was like, that's way too complicated. You just need one artist. And so I said, hey, Charlie, draw me a picture. And so he did. And then I was thinking, well, you know, wetlands evolve. How does Charlie's uh, drawings evolved? So he did this Wednesday. And I made it in this time. So yay. <laughs> we have some, yeah, some upland habitat, too. It's great. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. So uh, I was really excited to see the terrestrial stuff in your conceptual models. So hard, it's so hard to kind of reconcile those two ecosystems that we really end up studying separately a lot of the time. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to any impressions you've gotten so far about relationships between the terrestrial upland area and what you're seeing in your studies or any kind of impressions you think about how important those interfaces might be is it really important to be, should we be trying a lot harder to interface these studies or does it seem to you that they're relatively decoupled? Oh, that's a great question. And sadly, I think the conceptual models do not 
do justice to the terrestrial uh, or the transition zone. And partially that's just because, let's see, it's 365 pages, the technical report as it is. Um, so it was kind of an, a necessary evil to uh, narrow the scope. But I think it's very important that those models be developed. Um, so as part of Eco Restore, there's the, I see Lauren Hastings out here, the interagency adaptive management Im implementation team. Is that right? I am it. Integration. Integration. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> one of the the tasks there is to identify where there are holes in conceptual models and try to encourage those to be to be built. Um, so, I think there's some work there to couple those, and you know, it's it's difficult. There's a lot of work going on, and I think uh, you know our, our meeting with the USGS us talking more within our own office, <laughs> that's, that's a, a good step in the right direction. But we, we need to find ways to, to build those synergies and, and get more information out of our time. I don't know if we have a question or not. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, addressing the uh, whole issue as a food web a sort of based issue is a pretty nice thing to to actually to start from that framework and then figure out each component. So, my question is actually you, you, uh, throughout the slides or throughout the presentation, several of them actually having the primary and secondary productivities as one of the, uh, I think that has to be sort of a foundation of how you connect the food webs. And so question one will be who's doing it, actually measuring the primary and secondary productivity in terms of unit of, you know, secondary, uh, primary and secondary productivity. That's one thing. And then if you figure, try to figure out the food web throughout the system from, say, connecting the terrestrial to the interface to the aquatic system, what would be the uh, best common currency to put them together? So as for who's measuring them, we're, we're looking at standing stock. So we don't currently have the capacity to look at production rates, um, but we're measuring abundance and community composition of phytoplankton and zooplankton and epiphytic and benthic and epibenthic invertebrates. And then a common currency. Well, I think that it really depends on your question. You know, so kind of a, the first thing that would pop into my mind is carbon. But if we're thinking about fish food, um, maybe not. You know, so uh, thinking about the abundance of critters that fish like to eat um, for our particular questions, which is maybe not the, you know, the information that's needed for other questions. But that's, that's really our, our focus. Stacy, I, I have a question for you. On, uh, after hearing what your five-person team has done in the last few years, it, it's been pretty amazing. Have you had a chance to think about how the data that you've been generating now, uh, how you can feed those into the forecasting model so you don't have to, mo to monitor everywhere and everything, but you can actually project what the evolution of uh, a restored wetland might look like? once you plug in the data that you've generated up to date? Well, I, I think a couple of years of collection is not enough to, to get there. Um, so, I mean, we, and we haven't even you know, identified a lot of our samples. So I think that would be a great way to go down the line, but we're, we're certainly not there yet. You mentioned, you mentioned needing to coordinate the coordinators and also issues with permits and incidental takes. So presumably there's someone who's issuing these permits who's watching how much is being taken where. So um, are just the agencies that regulate these permits a good place to go to find out who all is out there um, doing measurements? And then also I'm wondering, do you know 
whether those who are issuing the permits sort of keep track of are there many different people who are all sampling in this one place and is that going to have a stronger impact? Well, that would be a great question for Heather Swinney, but I'm going to take a stab at it first. Um, so Heather's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, US Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, our work thus far has been permitted through, um, through them for Delta smelt take, but there's been a coordination element and a kind of a vetting element through the IEP. So I think Steve Culberson probably will talk a little bit about that next in, in January. Um, but so what they do, there's a science management team and they look at all of the study plans at once and they try to identify those overlaps or, or gaps or, you know, and say, look, we need to, um, you need to back off because this, <laughs> so that's, that's uh, one level of coordination, but there is some stuff, you know, like, um, like people collecting invertebrates for that, Ducks, you know, diving ducks might be eating. Like, I wouldn't know about that because they don't, they don't need the, the Delta smoke permits. So talking is important. And, um, you know, what Katie was talking about with the upland stuff, and she works with salt marsh, salt marsh har harvest mice. And uh, there's someone else in our, our office working on western pond turtle. And so I think those are, are some other places where we're, we're not necessarily paying attention, but there's, there's stuff happening. Did, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I just want to thank you for uh, in, including us in your studies and allowing us to come out and sample with you. It's been, it's really, it's fun, actually. It is. <laughs> we, we do take volunteers, so. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's fun. I can vouch for it. Um, yeah, so my question is just how will this monitoring um, assess the non-native species such as bass that are of interest but of course not the target of your inquiries? So the fish sampling, we need to go on a year-by-year -year basis um, because so we're, you know, we're looking at them right now um, because we have that in our work plan for, through IEP. Um, moving forward, our permitting will be through the, for the invertebrates, the individual projects. And so we will not have fish sampling involved with that. There's a possibility that there could be other fish sampling, but we'd have to go through a different permitting process for it. Um, so that's one of the, that's one of the, um, the problems, you know, it's, it's, we do want to know what's going on. Um, we would need to find a way to do it with a very limited, uh, take of, of Delta Smelt, so we might just have to be out there hook and line. That's even more fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or use the Aris, actually. I had a, a question uh, regarding your identification of, of samples. Could, could you speak to the relative uh, amount of work that it is to collect what it is you've collected? It sounds all very nice and dry and looks great on a whiteboard. Um, but could you give us a little bit of a sense of what's required to turn those data collected, those samples that are collected into data and the amount of, you mentioned there were 800 some odd samples that you've planned for this next year for invertebrates and 100 some odd fish samples or, or some numbers like that. Um, it would be illuminating, I think, for us to hear about the kind of work it takes to turn that into information. Yeah, Rosie might want to uh, touch on this later too. Um, that was that was her her realm. Um, it it takes a lot. It, it varies by sample type. So, um, for the fish samples, we have Dave Contreras, so we know our IDs are right. <laughs> so Dave's awesome. Um, for the the invertebrate samples, they, it depends on how messy they are. So if you take a core and you have a lot of organic matter in there. You have to sort through all of that. If you take a sweep net and you get a whole bunch of uh, stems of SAV in there, you have to sort through all of that. And then there's the ID. And we had, in the project work team, talked about using higher taxonomic levels for different uh, batches of critters. And, and we're still there for, you know, like, insects, but for copepods, we need to know the species because it, it does make a difference. 
So, um, and I cannot, I can't identify the copepods. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a specialized um, thing to learn. And then uh, we do, we have quality control, so we send some of them out uh, for independent ID. Did that get at your question? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, I, I mean, we're talking hundreds, like thousands. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I, maybe Rosie can speak to this, but I, one of the things that I find lacking from some of those, these discussions is a ground truth of what's actually involved. Like, just go collect the samples and tell us what's in them. Well, there's thousands of hours of ID and people. There aren't more than a few dozen people in the world who do this on a daily basis. And I'd like to give that a little attention because if you don't have people who can do this rapidly, you can take a week with a single sample to identify what's in it to be of any use. So anyway, you guys yeah, know this better than I. We, so. Well, we do have you know, subsampling protocols and uh, we, we try to make it manageable. And when we, we do look at the time that it takes on average to do different sample types. And so I think what we planned is not, you know, we can do it but I just wanted to impress you all. <laughs> Go ahead, Rosie. <laughs> I was just, just going to say... Um, it's on. Oh, there we go. Uh, a really light sample trained people can do in two hours. Uh, a sample that's difficult will take eight hours to two or three days. Usually we try and subsample before it gets more than eight hours, but uh, there's some situations where you just got to get through it. And that is a big uh, sore point um, in my mind that we don't appreciate our lab staff enough and we don't pay them enough. And uh, a lot of monitoring groups in the estuary send their samples off to contracting labs where they don't have oversight of the quality of the samples, um, but that is easier than trying to actually develop a good lab in-house. Um, so if I if I had my way, and if I was God, I would uh, triple the size of our lab and um, have all of IEP's invertebrate data analyzed there, and I'd triple the salaries of everyone working on that. So that we could actually keep good people. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, Stacy again, and uh, and I think we're scheduled for a, a ten-minute break, and then we'll come back for our uh, panel discussion. Yes, John. Yes, John. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Stacy will be joining our panel as well, so. This is a question that is perhaps best deferred for later on, but um, one of the things that emerges clearly from your graphs and which you appreciate even more fully than the graphs show is the tremendous spatial and temporal variability that you get. Uh, and that's what's shown in the samples that you have. And that, of course, is a sampling of the temporal and spatial variability that's actually out there. Uh, which occurs on multiple scales of time and space. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there are very real logistical and practical constraints in dealing with that. So the question, I think, that faces any monitoring program is how do you decide how best to do that? What is the what criteria do you use to decide how frequently to sample, how often to sample in various places? What goes into the design of a monitoring program that has some prospect of coming to grips with that tremendous temporal and spatial variability so that you're not just sort of picking points and assuming that those points reflect the reality that you have to deal with rather than by chance you've picked points that are that total outliers on what's happening. Right, so one important point to make is if you are interested in studying macroinvertebrates for their own sake, our data are not the ones to use. Um, so we chose the, 
that particular time in the spring, uh, we're, we have our temporal sampling going on at Decker to kind of help us refine that, and it, it probably will vary year to year. But we chose the spring because that's when we're going to have the highest densities of uh, migrating smolts to take advantage of that. And uh, when we have delta smelt more up in the, in the system away from the low uh, salinity zone. And so part of our timing, and this was developed through the, the project work team, is based on when the fish can best take advantage of the, the resources. So we know that the, the peaks in the macroinvertebrates would be later in the summer if we wanted to study them just for their own sake, we'd do it later. Um, so that's, that's one way. And then we, we are hoping that we will be able to uh, look at the variability from our samples now and then do some post hoc power analyses and, and see what we can, if we can possibly uh, trim some out. Did that, does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, I, I think I would suggest caution in stepping into the power analysis trap because uh, once you do that and you discover, oh, we don't have any power to say anything, <laughs> then you're kind of screwed. Yeah. Well, we did. We saw differences with our sweep nets between sites and habitats within a site. So, but no, you're of course you're right. There, the I think John Duran, when we were first talking to him about it, he's like the variability would be breathtaking, <laughs> and it is. But you know, so. We, uh, we, we do what we can and be as objective as we can, but we, we won't ever catch it all. Okay, thanks again. Um, we're scheduled for a 10-minute break, right? Okay, 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and uh, start our panel. Thank you. Thank you.